Are we recording? Oh, yeah, we're recording. Okay, so let's get rid of that. All right, second. Now, do any of you here like rock and roll? Do you like rock music? Do you like hippies? Do you like, do you like drinking and listening to music? And oh, You're young. You shouldn't. Dana raised her hand. She does, apparently. Oh, no, she was just fixing her hair. Sorry, recording. That was incorrect. Dana is not a big fan of drinking and listening to music. All right, so the second question that we have, and this is so, so, so my favorite part. We are talking now about the second lotus blossom. Notice we are in the crash of wave two. The crash of wave one, to remind you, what was the first lotus blossom? The, 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 the Joe dynasty... The soil is, is watered with the blood of its boys, fighting a 200-plus year World War II. It is a gruesome, ugly time. And yet, this amazing thing rises from that muck in the first crash of, of wave one. What is that thing that rose? The Hundred Schools of Thought. Taoism and Lao Tzu and Zhuangzi and Confucianism, these beautiful, sage, truly, truly wise, humane, gorgeous schools of thought come from the ugliest period of Chinese history, the first lotus blossom. The second one, we've got our second crash, and it's a pattern. When the Mongols come, you'll see the third lotus blossom. So here's the second one. It's not philosophical this time. So what is it? So here are the... Here are the we have the birth of what I call medieval hippies. To make this clear to you, as quickly as I can. When the Roman Empire fell, because the Roman emperors and government chose the new radical religion of Christianity as the official religion of the Roman Empire, when the government fell, the church survived. And the Roman Catholic Church ruled Europe for the next thousand years. That's the Middle Ages in the West. So what is the culture of medieval Europe? You read the poetry, you read the literature, it's all about God, Jesus, heaven, hell, the salvation of your soul, and how horrible the world is, and how you, 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 you thank God for sending Jesus to die for your sins. And you must make it through this horrible world in order to enjoy the kingdom of heaven forevermore. It is an age of theology, and theocracy. That's the Western medieval period. To me, it is utterly fascinating that because China's Han emperor did not say, yes, we're going with the Huang Lao Daoists, but instead crushed them because we are remaining true to our tradition of Confucianism and the imperial bureaucracy of the Western Zhou slash centralized bureaucracy of the Qin combination, right? The Han census. Um, when the Han fell, it did not go into the Western age of salvation religion because China crushed that. So China's poetry, China's culture during this age of division, during this medieval period, is these guys, our best example. The seven sages of the bamboo grove. If I were a rock band, I would name myself something like that. What an awesome rock band name. The Seven Sages of the Bamboo Grove. I mean, I'm sorry. Right? You think I'm exaggerating? Look at these guys. If this is not a hippie, in 1960 San Francisco, during the Vietnam era, when American educated college student boys and girls, young men and women, were looking at their government and saying, why are we napalming Vietnam villages, grass huts of farmers? Why are we killing, dropping bombs from airplanes? Thousands of bombs at a time, carpet bombing, rice fields of villages owned by peasant families because they're supporting Ho Chi Minh, who is a communist, on the other side of the world. In the 1960s, why did rock and roll emerge because young people were disgusted by what their parents' generation were doing. They were disgusted by the government and the culture of their day. They said, this is corrupt. This is totally immoral. This is unconscionable. We are killing Vietnamese farming families. 
by the, no exaggeration, millions. We killed more Vietnamese than, Ch than Singapore has people with our bombs and our soldiers. And so the hippies said, this is literally making me spiritually sick and nauseated. I quit. I quit this culture. I drop out. I'm looking for something wiser and something better. And so they turned to drugs, acid, mushrooms, peyote, psychedelic drugs. Psychedelic drugs do give you a spiritual experience. They do give you, hello, they, they interact with your brain chemically and they create all sorts of hallucinatory, visionary experiences that are staggering, okay? Um, if you know anything about history, you know that many cultures, and you're young and, and you've never probably even heard drugs talked about historically, and so you're giving me the funny looks that Emma's giving me. Oh, he's talking about drugs. Um, let's try to be mature and think about history. Many, many, many native cultures around this planet centered their religions on taking a mushroom or a peyote plant or any number of herbs that when you, when you swallow them, they give you visions. Literally, they give you visions. <laughs> visions that don't happen in your normal consciousness. And those visions are very, very impressive. And you come down from them and you go, I just had, I just had an experience. It was transcendent. It was mystical. It was divine. And it was totally mysterious. Native cultures learned how to not party with it, but honor it as a mysterious thing. And so they would do it. And, I, and I, have, I will tell you, Native Americans were, there was a peyote church, for example, in the Native American Sioux Indian culture. And I actually went to a peyote church ceremony in a teepee with a Native American chief, medicine man. And we sat in a circle around a fire all night long, and we drank the peyote, and there was drums and music and all that sort of thing in a teepee, sitting straight up, being as Confucian, Confucian ritually proper as you can imagine. You did not, like, you didn't lean over. You were sitting Indian style, cross-legged, on the ground. From sundown, when you crawled into the tent and took your place around the fire, until sunrise the next morning. You hear that? Sundown to sunrise, you are sitting in place, in a circle with other people, and this is a religious ceremony and ritual. And you're having visions. You're passing a tea of peyote, person to person, drinking it. It makes you sick. Some people throw up, but they do it with ritual propriety. And there's a fire tender there who is the entire time, the fire, the fire tender is one of the, the ritual officials. Um, and he is, he is skilled in shaping the fire into different, the, the firewood and such into different shapes and such. There's music going, the acoustics of a cone, which is what a TV is. The acoustics of a cone, the, 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 the sounds just swirl around the cone walls of, you're sitting inside of a cone, and there are drums, and there are whistles, and there's singing, and there's, uh, you know, chanting, all sorts of stuff, and there's a fire. And so the visuals and the acoustics of it are amazing when you have this religious uh, herb influencing your perception of it all. And, um, and the fire tender is like shoveling the fire into different, different shapes. It's an eagle. An hour later, you notice that the eagle has become a snake because the fire tender is, is, is doing art by shaping the fire. Amazing stuff. Um, and when people throw up, the fire tender takes a, takes a shovel, puts some, some dirt and some hay on the, on the vomit, shovels it up, takes it outside, buries it comes back in and everything is orderly and everything continues. And what are you doing in there? You're not partying going, oh dude, we're doing drugs. No. What did we do the night I was there? We prayed for a woman who had cancer. And we prayed for her healing. So this is, a, this is an example of a traditional, um, a traditional uh, hippie culture. Uh, I'm sorry, drug culture. But in any case, so what did the hippies do? In America, they had no choices, really. Well, what could they do? There were no other religions besides the, besides the church, and the church was what their parents' generation went to. And so they were so disgusted by the Vietnam War, they were like, I, my parents go to church, and they're doing this to the Vietnamese, so I can't accept the church. The government, I can't accept the government. I don't want to work for the corporations. I drop out. And so they grew their hair long, they wore tie-dye shirts, and they, they turned to drugs. They also turned to Taoism, and Buddhism, and Indian religion, and all sorts of stuff. They were looking for a counterculture to their own. In the same way now, 
What happens when you are an educated Confucian and the Jin Dynasty takes over and they're corrupt and they're stupid? They start feudalism. Remember Confucius said, when asked how to serve a prince, he said, tell him the truth even if it offends him. There were educated young Chinese who told the Jin the truth even though it offended them. You should not do this feudalism. It is stupid. History should have taught you that. And when they told them these things, they were not respected and listened to. They were instead um, punished and threatened. And second, another thing Confucius said, commit to the love of learning and to defending the good way with your life. Commit to that. Commit to defending the good way with your life. Don't enter a land that's unstable. The Jin Dynasty is unstable. Don't linger in a country in revolt. The Jin Dynasty is in revolt. Shine in a world that follows the way. Hide when the world loses the way. The Jin Dynasty had lost the way. In a country where the way prevails, it's shameful to remain poor and unknown. So if you're living in a good country that's decent, you should be successful because it, it rewards good people. In a country that has lost the way, Confucius said, it's shameful to become rich, and it's shameful to be honored. The Vietnam era in the United States lived this. They, would not, they did not want to become rich and honored in a culture that had lost the way in the United States in the 1960s. Thus the hippies, they dropped out. They considered it shameful. By the way, I, I, I cry when I see so many of my, my students here at SAS and other schools before SAS graduate and go and try to become rich and honored in the shameful culture that we have today in which the rich-poor gap is wider than it has been in 130 years because our elites today are, they've lost the way. They don't care about the people, right? They care about their own enrichment. They don't want to pay taxes. Are you kidding? Uh, on and on and on. But in any case, Check out what these guys did. This is the 1960s. So our first example is the Seven Sages of the Bamboo Grove. Yep. This is during the Jin Dynasty, so between 265 and its collapse in 307. Okay. So you've got to realize, right, the Han Dynasty people are still alive. They're still alive. The Han Dynasty is just fall. And so all the people who had been preparing for the government and wanting to get a job and be an elite, they're seeing a new Jin Dynasty and they're going, Confucius wouldn't want me to work for these guys. And some of them took that seriously. Now, of course, many of them didn't. They sold out. And they were like, Confucius be damned. I want to get rich. The Jin Dynasty will make me rich. I'll join them. I saw a hand. Do I know? Yeah. Um, do the seven sages and the second lotus blossom is, like, fall under the same... Temple? The second lotus blossom... The first lotus blossom is the Confucians and the Hundred Schools of Thought. The second lotus blossom is this group of counterculture rebels. So that's yeah. So what is the second lotus blossom? Counterculture rebels. That's why I call them the hippies or the rock stars. Here's my evidence. Yeah. What, what exactly were they against in the Jin Dynasty? The Jin Dynasty was not virtuous. They were not sage kings. Hello, the brothers were disloyal to the king of the Jin dynasty, right? He gives them vassal states, and they, instead of being loyal to that and saying, okay, we will keep our place and, you know, honor the unity and be loyal to it, they instead start fighting each other, trying to, get, trying to gain more power for themselves. So it was the Eastern Joe all over again. It's a new warring states period. Except it happened in 30 years, and it, and it was all over. So what did these people do? What did the good Confucians do? They retreated, man. They, well, they went into the mountains, and they went into the countryside. The Seven Sages are our most famous example of that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quickly... All of, this is, all of these are, are artworks, famous artworks from Chinese, Chinese art, to show you that, that these guys are, are loved and honored um, in China. You can just look at the picture. What are they doing? They're showing that they reject the culture by growing their hair long. Well, no, 
take that back. That would be a Western thing. The Confucians always put their hair longer than their bodies or hair, and it's a gift to you and you don't cut your hair. Um, but check him out, right? This is looking like a total bum. Shoes kicked off. Um, big jug of wine. Whoops. You know what's this guy doing? He's got his guitar. He's got his guitar. What are we doing? We are hanging out in nature with friends, and we are playing music, and we are refusing to give our talents to the corrupt culture of the elites, because the elites are disgusting. Interestingly enough, and so here is, here's our oldest evidence of them. Look at this. Guys, this is not boring. Come on. Give me some energy. What's odd about this painting? I'm sorry. What's odd about this image? Look at it. There's something obviously odd about it that just make you go, what the? What's the obvious weird thing about the image that you're looking at right now? Obvious, simple. Please. Good. No, 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 no. <laughs> the, the, most, the most, look, what tells you that this is not a painting? It's the what? The tile shapes. Thank you. Hello, look at the grid thing. Obvious. What's not obvious is, what is it? Anybody have any guesses as to where this was painted? Part of a wall. It is part of a wall. Those are bricks. Huh? It's a mural, and I'll just cut to the chase, of a tomb. Of a tomb. Somebody was put underground in a tomb and their, their eternal resting place for their spirit, their ghost, was decorated with a painting of hippies. And this is from the 4th century. This is a 1,600-year-old tomb painting. How many of you have a, a poster of a rock star or a pop star or a musician on your wall in your bedroom? You're a liar. Really? Really? None of you has a poster of your favorite band or singer or anything in your room? One. Wow. Did you ever? How weird. Your parents don't let you or has it? Oh, well, I had so many different posters in that. Did you always have fun? Did I have these We have countless tombs all across the South with these guys painted on them. Why? The two most famous are, are Shi Kong. He's also called Ji Kong. He was said to be seven feet tall, as tall as Yao Ming. And the best Gu Chen lute player, you see it in his lap? A musician of the gods. He, his, his music, his playing of the guitar of ancient China was legendary. So China's Jimi Hendrix, in a sense. And Ruenji. Ruenji is practicing a Taoist whistling exercise. They had all sorts of practices, the Taoists, to attain immortality, including uh, immortality of the body, including whistling. Whistling in such a way to make your chi sort of reorganize in your body. Uh, notice his, his jug of wine with a little rubber ducky in it. Oh, Monday morning, no sense of humor. It's a ladle, it's not a rubber ducky. It's Thursday. Oh, it's Thursday, but it feels like Monday, doesn't it? Not only are they famous in China, they're also famous in Japan. This is a Japanese shrine to the seven sages. The Karaman, no, I'm sorry, the Niko Toshugi, Toshugu shrine, and the, the seven sages are honored in this shrine. This is a temple to the seven sages in freaking Japan. So they were international rock stars, yeah. There were seven of them. Ruenji and, and Shikong are the, are the two most famous. Oh, I can't go off any further on the seven sages other than to say that I'll tell you one story of Ruenji, the guy who was whistling. The Jin dynasty wanted Smarin. The Jin dynasty wanted Ruenji to marry into their family because he was known to be sage and smart. He was the best of the best. Harvard material. And they wanted him, one of the princes wanted him in his court to enhance the reputation of his court. And Ruenji was like, I'm not going to marry into this scumbag's court. I don't care if he is Donald Trump. 
Mitt Romney, whoever. I'm not going to marry into his court. But if I don't, these people are ruthless. They will kill me. They have killed other people who have defied their authority and egos. And so he does the most amazing thing in the world to keep, to make them decide they don't want this genius in their family. If I had more time, I would ask you, how would you keep, how would you make a family not want you to marry their daughter? Anybody have an instant brilliant idea to keep a family from wanting to? Tattoos. Tattoos, pretty good. What could you do that's more? Say you're gay? Okay, what Rowan G. did, according to tradition, went on an epic 60-day drunk, woke up in the morning, drunk himself into a stupor, and staggered around the village making an ass of himself and a spectacle of himself, the town drunk, just disgraceful, 60 straight days. And he became legendary for being the biggest freaking loser drunk in Chinese history. And they were like, oh God, no, we don't want this guy marrying our daughter. Engagement's off. And he's like, woohoo! And he sobered up, and he went back to writing poetry. <laughs> and hanging out with his friend, uh, the seven-foot-tall Shi Kong. Shi Kong was not so lucky. He refused to get to marry into the, Jing, uh, the, the, the Suma family of the Jin Dynasty. And they um, trumped up charges, arrested him, and he was executed and beheaded. The Jin princes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because what is a good emperor? A good emperor is one of you of whom the Confucians, a good king, a good prince, the Confucians must approve of him for him to deserve the mandate. So I must be surrounded by scholars who say you're good. I support you. If they if they won't do that, then then I don't have status. I don't have that Confucian stamp of approval, right? That's the whole Han Dynasty thing, right? You've got to be a, you've got to be a, a sage king. Who says you're a sage king? The Confucians who uh, If you want to read in the packet There are some wonderful readings about Ruenji and, and Shi Kong, and I'll just tell you the last thing about Shi Kong. I love these guys. I hate not being able to, but in Asian lip we do. We have a letter from this man, seven foot tall. When he was drunk, when he was sober, he was said to be as stable and as, as, as grand as a mountain, impressive and serene and calm. But when he was drunk, he leaned and mountains fell over. They all liked to drink. They hung out in bamboo forests, drank together, had conversations, wrote poetry, and made music. That's what they did. They dropped out. They weren't doing LSD, acid, or peyote, but they were doing wine. They weren't doing women and sex like the 60s hippies were. They were doing friendship. And when Ruenji's friend sold out and joined the Gen Court, his friend Shantak, when he sold out and joined the Nixon administration during the Vietnam War, and said, hey, I got a job for you. Come on. It's a killer job. Come on, Shi Kong join this gen court. We have a letter from him in which he explains in beautifully condescending terms why he would never dream of it. And then at the end of the letter says, and furthermore, the fact that you have invited me to join this corrupt elite culture prompts me to basically say, you, sh you don't know me. I thought I knew you, but I don't. And our friendship is at an end goodbye, never speak to me again, right? And so he just, he, he, he cuts him off in this letter, and that's the end. He wrote a, a, a beautiful poem on his guitar, his, his, his lute, that's just gorgeous. Um, and so why are there pictures on, uh, on tombs everywhere? Because they were honorable, they were beautiful, they were impressive, and they refused to pursue honor and fame in a culture that lost the way. Here's another guy, just, just famous in Chinese poetry. He was part of the Jin Dynasty, but at 40 years old, he was like, screw this. I quit. I'm going to live in a grass hut in the countryside and farm. He turned his back on it, and he was like, this is horrible. His name is Tao Chen. Look at him. I'm not exaggerating. Is he a hippie? He's wearing flowers in his hair. 
This is a flower garden this man is wearing. He's famous for quitting the elite. So, you see here, in short, in the second lotus blossom, a new cultural flowering of art and poetry that combines Confucianism and Taoism. You see how? What's the Confucian part of this? I just gave you the quotes, the Confucian quotes to start this thing. Rejecting a society that's lost their way. What's the Taoist part of it? Are you, have you learned that little? What is Taoism value? What's the way in Taoism? More? Living as nature would have you live? Simply? Simply? Not wanting a whole lot? Enjoying the moment? That's what these guys did. The Confucian side of them said, don't serve them. And then they were like, there's a Taoist option. We will just go and live simply. And they did. I sometimes sign up my username as Mr. Five Willows. Because Tao Chien, the guy with flowers in his hair. This little two-paragraph thing is just gorgeous. You can read it on your own. It's in the packet that I gave you. It's just gorgeous. When I read it, I was like, I just fell in love. And so I decided I would call myself Five Willows in certain forums and such because uh, he's so cool. No wonder they love this guy. Um, all right. Closing that one. Oops. So that's the end of that one, the second Lotus Blossom. Any questions? <laughs>